One of the things people often tell me they dislike about fundamentalist preachers is the fact that they are too judgmental. Usually, of course, the irony of such a statement is lost on folks. After all, saying someone is judgmental is judgmental. But that notwithstanding, I do understand what they mean. They don't appreciate the black and white thinking that often seems to accompany a, a much more conservative approach to Christianity. They don't like the way that some people are in and others are out. They don't like that approach. They, they don't like the notion that folks are judged at the end of life and sent to heaven or hell based on the results. No, folks don't like that kind of judgment. An old far side cartoon. A fellow stands at the pearly gates. St. Peter speaks. Okay, now listen up. Nobody gets in here without first answering the following question. A train leaves Philadelphia at 1 p.m. It's traveling at 65 miles an hour. Another train leaves Denver at 4. The caption reads, A Math Phobic's Worst Nightmare. No, we don't like the idea of judgment. The odd thing, however, is that even though we say we dislike judgmentalism, we're living in a day and age where everybody has become a judge and a jury. Just this week, for instance, I was invited to cast my vote for a friend's rock band, a rock band I've never heard play, who is trying to be the band of the month in New York City. I know something about rock bands, but what do I know about small rock bands in New York City? But Danner, you be the judge. Cast your vote. I was asked to vote for my service club in the annual Best of the Islands competition, as if all the other service clubs aren't also great. And every other program on television features a panel of judges and an opportunity for you, the audience, to judge contestants as well. The phone lines stay open for two hours after the show. Text your vote, email your vote, put it on Facebook, send it by carrier pigeon. You be the judge, you be the jury, you decide. So let's begin by recognizing that, like it or not, judgment is an everyday reality, even more so in our virtual age. And while choosing the best act on a variety show may be rather trivial, the truth is we often pass judgment, all of us on people, on places, on things and ideas. It might be helpful to define terms here. What exactly do we mean by the word judgment? And what does it mean to judge? Webster defines it this way. Judge, verb, to form an opinion about someone or something through careful weighing of evidence and testing of premises. It comes from the roots jus, meaning right, and decir, meaning to decide. To judge is to decide what is right. To decide what is right. Our passage from Luke this morning is about judgment, and it is a tough one. It presents Jesus in a way that, frankly, makes us rather uncomfortable. Whatever happened to the sweet, gentle Savior? What happened to peace on earth and goodwill to all? This sounds more like a fire and brimstone sermon. 
And in some ways, that's exactly what it is. Throughout his ministry, Jesus has been preaching the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the reign of God. He has taught that the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. He has reminded his listeners again and again that wealth and power aren't what count in the realm of God. The playing field, he says, needs to be leveled. Everybody needs to get a fair shake. All of which is well and good if you are among the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden. But if you're sitting pretty, it probably sounds rather threatening. The only way to lasting peace, says Jesus, is God's way the way of justice. You, says Jesus, you can choose to be a part of that or you can choose to opt out. Some, he says, will choose God's way and others will not. Even family members, he says, may be divided in their judgments, in their opinions. That, he says, is inevitable. But in the end, you must judge for yourself, says Jesus. You must decide what is right. As one scholar notes, although the reign of God is characterized by reconciliation and peace, the announcement of that kingdom is always divisive because it requires decision and commitment. You have to judge for yourself. You have to choose what is right. Later this month, we will mark the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, that moment in history when one million Americans gathered on the Mall in Washington, D.C. to protest the state of race relations in our nation. They were inspired by many speakers and singers that day, but most notably, of course, by Martin Luther King, Jr., who gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. It was a great day for King, but the way had not been easy. As a 25-year-old graduate of Boston University's doctoral program, he turned down three teaching positions to take up the pulpit at Dexter Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama the first capital of the Confederacy. The year was 1954. At the time, Montgomery was deeply submerged in segregationist culture. The playing field was anything but level. The average annual income for whites at that time in Montgomery was $1,730 a year. The average annual income for blacks was only $970 a year. 92% of white homes had indoor plumbing. Only 34% of those occupied by blacks had the same. Only 2,000 of the 30,000 blacks who were eligible to vote in the city were registered to vote. And it wasn't because they didn't want to vote or weren't willing to make time to get to the registration station. And all public places in Montgomery, all of them, were segregated. In December of the following year, Rosa Parks famously was arrested 
for refusing to give up her seat on a segregated bus and launched what would become a boycott of the city buses in that city by African-American residents. The boycott itself took a great deal of coordination and planning, and King offered his church for the meetings. He was also elected to be the head of the Montgomery Improvement Association, an organization dedicated to eliminating segregation and raising the living standards of the poor. Various folks joined and supported the cause. Black taxi companies provided transportation for those who no longer took the buses. There were carpools, even some sympathetic white employers provided rides for black workers needing to get to jobs. There were nightly pep rallies, there were prayer meetings. People had to make decisions. The kind of division within families that Jesus talked about happened all across Montgomery. People had to judge. People had to determine whether or not they would support this effort, whether or not it was right. And those choices, those choices came with a price for many. Jobs were lost, families were divided, and while the protesters always adhered to a principle of nonviolence, there were times when they were physically attacked. As a result of his decision, his judgment to lead the effort, King received many death threats. It was, needless to say, a stressful time for his wife, Coretta. One night, King received a phone call well after the normal time for calls. Listen, said an ominous voice at the other end of the line. We will take all we want from you before next week you'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery. It totally unnerved the young preacher. King writes of that night, I prayed, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but, but now I am afraid. I've come to a point where I can't face it alone. At which time, he heard an inner voice. Stand up for righteousness, said the voice. Stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. And so bolstered, he carried on. But it was not the end of threats. The following January, a bomb was left on the front porch of his home. The KKK rode through town. King was arrested and fined for leading the boycott. It wasn't until almost a year later that bus segregation was finally declared unconstitutional by the federal authorities. And even then, the violence continued. But King had judged for himself. He had determined what he believed to be right. And despite severe opposition, King remained firm in his convictions. And in the end, of course, it cost him his very life. The day after he was assassinated, his wife, Coretta, issued a statement. He knew that at any moment his physical life could be shut, cut short. And we faced this possibility squarely and honestly. 
He gave his life for the poor of the world. Nothing hurt him more than that humankind could find no way to solve problems except through violence. He gave his life, she said, in search of a more excellent way. A more excellent way. Not a more popular way. Rather, the way of God. The way of peace and reconciliation. The way of justice, not just for some, but for all. You may not have to give up your life like Jesus did. You may not have to give up your life like King did. But you will most certainly give your life if you choose what is right. You will give your whole life. Judge for yourself, said Jesus. Make a choice. Determine what is right. It's not about avoiding hell. It is about working for the heavenly cause here on earth. The cause of peace and justice and righteousness. Judge for yourself, says Jesus. How will you live? Sisters and brothers, as we move into these next couple of weeks, we will be reminded many times over of that day in 1963. And while it will be tempting to say, so much has changed, things are so much better, we must not forget that the work is not done. The gap between rich and poor grows more and more every year in this country and around the globe. The difference between the haves and the have-nots is far wider today than it was in the day of Martin Luther King. Prejudice, discrimination, they haven't disappeared. How we address those things what we do about them is something you need to judge for yourself. You need to determine what is right and what you will do to advance the truth. Is this a comfortable passage in Luke? No way. Is this a comfortable sermon? No way. Is this vital to our well-being as individuals? and as a society, every way. Judge for yourself.